welcome, Elizabeth Faubert, and thank you for sharing some time with us. Uh, we wanted to talk to you about the literary animal project that you do. And uh, before that, maybe get a little bit of background about you, how you got started in photography. Well, Nathan, would you mind uh, possibly just, you know, tell us about you so everybody can get to know you? Okay, well, thank you very much. It's nice to be here today. I started doing photography way back in high school. I went to a public high school, but they had a program there for art, and I was an art major. And luckily for me, they also had a dark room. So when I was studying art in high school, I took a photography class, and I just immediately fell in love with the dark room and just kept going after that. So I've been doing photography ever since then. I also studied it in college, and I've just been doing it my whole life, almost. So, yeah, that's... um. That's probably a long time. Is that 30 years? Is that about the same as me with the guitar? <laughs> it's, it's actually 40, 40, 41 years or something like that. I graduated from high school in 1979. I'm 58 years old now. Okay. Let's, uh, the thing I really, I really want to talk about what I find so fascinating. Could you tell people please about the literary animal, how you came up with it, the genesis of it? just find the whole thing to be so unique and so artistic and it's also funny I love it could you tell people a little bit about that yes uh the literary animal is my passion project I would say it is a gift for me as far as art goes because I've been doing photography and making photos and doing art photography like I said since high school so what the literary animal gave me was a series. And I think for any art form, a series can be vital to work on a piece of work and make it into a big body of work. And previous to the literary animal, I had never had that. It was kind of like I did a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But the literary animal turned into a series for me and it is the most fun thing for me that I do with my photography. So you have a lot, I'm glad to hear that it's fun because I get a lot of enjoyment from seeing the photos. Mm -hmm. So what was the, uh, what gave you the idea for the literary animal? How did that, how did that come about? Well, I am a big book lover. I have always loved books and reading. So one day I went to a garage sale and this was probably about, mm, maybe 35 years ago or so, I went to a garage sale and there was a copy of the book Of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck. And I had read it before, but this was a, a different cover. So I thought, oh, I'll buy this. It was probably a dollar, you know. And I brought it home. And at the time I had a cat. And so after I got home with the book, I was sitting there with my cat and I thought, oh, you know, it'd be really funny for a cat to read the book of Mice and Men. And <laughs> yes. yeah, exactly. So I just set the book on the floor standing up with the with it open. And I sat it next to my cat and I just kind of waited for her to look in that direction. And she did. And then I snapped the picture and I thought it was funny. You know, I, I showed it to a few friends and my friends that I showed it to said, oh, my gosh, this is hilarious. You know, you should make these into cards. You should make these into postcards, etc." So I did. And then there was a bookstore in St. Pete at the time um, that I frequented. And the woman that owned the bookstore saw them and she wanted to sell them in the store. So she did. So that was the beginning. Of course, at that moment that was not a series, that was just one photo. But then I started living with somebody who had a dog and I thought, well, what would a dog read? And so then I started thinking of things <laughs> for the dog to read and it just kind of really took off from there. I mean, I was so inspired. I just kept thinking of more and more things and um, I was photographing my friend's pets, my co-workers' pets. Uh, it was just one of those things that really took fire. And at the time, I was also shooting with film. 
So it was, um, you know, something that had to go through a longer process than digital. But it was, uh, anyway, it was a lot of fun. It really uh, just kept going from there. And it turned into all different kinds of animals, not just cats and dogs, but people that had lizards and pigs. And I would go to great lengths to find a certain animal. Like I had this idea, oh, it'd be funny for a pig to read the South Beach diet which was a popular time. <laughs> well, I didn't have a pig and I didn't know anybody that had a pig. So I called the 4-H club. I found somebody that had a pig. Um, you know, it, it's just been a crazy wild ride with this whole series of photos. Uh, it's yeah, it's hilarious. And uh, so I think of two things right away when you're, when you were saying, when you were telling me that the, the first I wanted to ask you about is, so it sounds like right from the very beginning that people have enjoyed this idea. Is that fair? Yes. Right from the very, very beginning, people thought it was funny. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to understand, like, it, it, I know you personally, so I know you have a great sense of humor. You're hilarious anyway. The literary animal, to me, it feels like it encompasses so much of you as a person artists focus on like one part, you know, usually, I mean, like I can't express everything I want to tell people about myself playing um, fake Eddie Van Halen solos. What do you think about that? Or do you think about it? Is this just something, did you, you almost like said it was intuitive, but I'm kind of curious, was there conscious thought about it or did it happen? Um, you know, it's almost like alchemy. You have everything about you kind of comprised in this, in this idea the series. Yes, I would agree with that. I feel that it is kind of like an alchemy. Many artists of all different types of art will t say that they felt moved by something or, you know, something just came from above or whatever you want to call it. And that's how it was with me. This sort of just fit me, suited me so well. And um, I felt so much inspiration from it. You know, I would just keep having these ideas or, or like one day, uh, this dog, I was at my house and I had the car door open and this dog just came out of nowhere and jumped into my car. And I thought, oh, <laughs> you know, I could, there was a pit bull and I thought, oh, I could photograph that dog with this book, you know, and then I, the woman came to get her dog and I told her, can I take pictures of your dog? And she's like, sure, you know, so, um, <laughs> That happened all the time where I would just see an animal. Sometimes sometimes it would be the book first. I would think of a book and then try to find the animal. But a lot of times it would happen that I would just see an animal and I would think, oh, you know, this, this animal should read this book. I started to call myself the librarian <laughs> for the animals. Um, and it was really amazing how working with animals went so deep sometimes because I almost believed that the animals knew what I was trying to do and wanted to help me. <laughs> yeah. And so many times if I just let the animal do what they wanted and not try to force them to do something in particular, they would make the photo better. And I have so many of examples of this it's just uh, um, unbelievable but a couple of them are like one time I was photographing a little dog with the book the call of the wild you know the famous book the call of the wild on the cover of the the book of the call of the wild is the wolf with a, you know where it's taking down another animal and it kind of has it pinned to the ground and um so I'm photographing this little dog and the, I had it up on a table with the book and the dog jumped off the table to go get its toy. It has this little stuffed animal toy that it plays with all the time. So I, you know, it jumped off the table, it went and got his toy, it jumped back on the table with the toy and it had the toy underneath it and it basically mirrored the cover of the book. Wow. Which was something... I could have never done purposefully. I didn't even think of that or anything like that, you know, and it, 
And I just thought, you know, that's what ha- that has happened so many times. It's just astounding to me. Yeah, and I feel that often animals are a lot smarter than we sort of conceive them to be. You know, people always say, you know, dumb animal. But uh, I think maybe they're not as dumb as as dumb as as they're supposed to be (laughs) you know that's yes i agree there i really that's why i mean i felt like i really had a deeper connection with animals from doing this because it was kind of like we were you know mentally or emotionally connecting on some level you know trying to accomplish something together where it took time and patience and uh really listening you know being able to observe the animals to this degree you know just taking that much time to see what they're doing what they're comfortable with how they react to certain things what might get their attention what won't you know and it really um it really it really was a deep practice for me and it also started me you know doing more pet sitting and things like that, you know, because I was always around all these animals all the time and people saw how I connected with them. And then they'd say, well, will you take care of my cat or my dog while I'm away? So it kind of started a little side business for me that way. That's awesome. And that reminds me of something else I wanted to ask you. So you were talking about capturing that really great moment when the dog has its toy. Um, I know that you practice yoga. Yes. So how do you, I mean, can you talk a little bit about, I don't even know how to phrase this, but you know, what it takes to actually capture a moment. Does, do you think maybe yoga makes you any better at that? What's the thought process? Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the, what do they call it? The holy moment? Uh, something I'm really interested in. Yes. I would say it's the, the, the essence of being here now. And trying not to get Mm -hmm. too caught up in what I want to happen and just being okay with what's happening at the moment and not trying to force something to happen and, and just see what happens, you know, it's really been a great experience for making art and allowing things to just happen as they naturally unfold. Yeah, that's exactly what I what I thought you might say, <clears throat> what about like doing yoga? Is that, does that make it easier for a photographer when you have to like stoop down? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a great question. And I don't think that practicing yoga necessarily makes it any better, but of course I want to be in good shape. <laughs> I want to be in good shape for things like that. I want to be able to move around and, and everything. I, you know, I think yoga is helpful for anybody, you know, Yeah, and you uh, you lead a yoga class yourself, right? You're also a yoga instructor. I lead laughter yoga classes, so it's a little bit laughter different. Yoga. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, laughter yoga is not traditional yoga in that sense. And laughter yoga, we literally laugh. We make ourselves laugh, or we laugh naturally. Uh, the premise of it is that you breathing and laughing is healthy. You know, the old saying, laughter is the best medicine, is really true. Um, But with laughter yoga, the science has backed up that it doesn't matter if you're laughing because something's funny or if you make yourself laugh, your body still does the same thing and gets the same health benefits. I had a psychology class. And I remember our professor saying that exact thing, that your body chemically will will reflect whatever you do physically. So, you know, even if you just smile, whether you mean it or not, your body still sends those chemicals out as if something really great exactly. happened. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Mm-hmm. And and it's about breathing too, though, right? That's that's the other part of it. Though, how how important? Because you, I remember you telling me that that it's about. You know, yes. Breathing, oxygen. Yes. In laughter yoga, we breathe and we stretch and we laugh. There are laughter exercises. There are little laughter exercises that 
uh, the doctor that invented laughter yoga, he came up with these laughter exercises that kind of get the laughter going. And especially when you're in a group of people and being silly, you know, it's easier to laugh that way. And um, we just have little things. And, and in laughter yoga, we also practice laughing about things that sometimes might not be funny, you know, outwardly. That, um, <laughs> like with the first time I went to a laughter yoga class, the instructor said, uh, okay, you go out to the car, you know, you go out to the parking lot and your car won't start. Ha 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 ha. <laughs> and, and I thought, you know, <laughs> that is right, funny. I, did, I did it, but I thought, oh, these people are crazy. That's not funny. You know, my car won't start. <laughs> but after I kept going back, after several weeks, I realized that um, it's not that we're laughing because it happened. It's, a, it's not the worst thing in the world. You know, we can laugh and not be stressed out about that. You know, the car will start again. The car will be towed. We call AAA. We call a friend. You know, um, it doesn't have to be a stressful situation. You know, so that's that's the whole point of it, you know, is learning to laugh about things and not take everything so seriously all the time and be healthy. So, um, so I, it, so using your body, having your, your body as your, you know, sort of instrument and a little bit, but also of course, a camera, um, is involved in there somewhere. And, um, I did want to ask you about if you would care to talk about a little bit about the, the technical aspects of what you do. I know you're, you know, you've been a photographer for a long, long time. It's not the only thing you take pictures of literary animals, but you, you do everything. So um, I think it would be interesting to find out a little bit about, you know, your technique, your equipment that you use. Um, would you mind talking about that? No, that would be great. I love to talk about cameras <laughs> and equipment. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so of course, when I started out, I was shooting film. Um, I'm, shot film all the time up until the digital age began and when I started doing the literary animal it was still just film and the camera what I would do is that camera did not have automatic film advance or automatic focusing so I was photographing animals and trying to get them you know looking at the book and I didn't have autofocus, I would have to focus. And then when I would take a shot, I would have to take the camera away from my face to advance the film, possibly missing another shot. <laughs> but um, I think that I really learned a lot from that because it made it more challenging to be fast and get the shot, um, being more intuitive to kind of be ahead of it, you know, kind of being uh, aware of what's going on and being ready. So I think that was very helpful, helpful for me. And then, of course, when the digital cameras all became the thing to do and I got a digital camera and it just seemed so different. You know, my digital camera, uh, I almost always use autofocus because it's so good. And, of course, it automatically advances Um I don't have to do that anymore. So, but so even now when I'm shooting digital, I still have that practice where I don't have to shoot bam, 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 one after another to get the shot. You know, I don't waste a lot of shots that way. So I think that doing this with film for so long really helped prepare me for digital and just, you know, dealing with it in a different way. Is it do you? Um, so yeah, definitely. And it reminds me, like, of almost like of archery um, when you're talking about you know preparing yourself, and then I don't know. I guess they call it shooting photos. Yeah. So it's kind of like, yeah, yeah, something yeah, like that. I, I maybe like, I like, yeah, um, because I say that all the time. You know, I shot somebody. I'm shooting somebody. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> You so are? I, like that, I like I like that what? comparison in a way. It does it does fit right in with it, you know. But yeah, it is something you know, anticipating the shot is important, you know. Beginners in digital photography, you will see that most of the time they just bam, 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 shoot, 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 shoot. 
because they say, well, it doesn't matter. You know, you can shoot all you want, you know, and everything. But I think there is something to being in touch with your subject and anticipating what's going to happen and being prepared for it. Yeah, it seems like it, it would. And I know that, that some hunters have, you know, it's some, they have like a sort of a, a turning point, you know, maybe ethically, whatever, philosophically, and they'll begin to take photos of animals instead. Takes the same sort of uh, discipline mm -hmm. to get that close. And then, and then instead of a dead animal, you have a photo of, of an animal yeah, that's, still yeah, alive. That's good. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, um, but yeah, back to, so let's get really technical about it. Um, can you talk about some of the lenses that you use? Maybe your, you know, your camera body that you have now, maybe compare that to, you know, what are the advantages or disadvantages? I know we've had a lot of talks about analog mm -hmm. versus digital. Well, for me, uh, being a, a film person from the beginning, I still really love the look of film and digital has still not gotten to that point yet, but I have embraced digital and uh, I do think that of course, there are many advantages to digital as in, you know, we're not wasting paper, chemicals, things like that. Also, like I said, you know, on my camera, the focus, the autofocus is really good. So that saves me a lot, you know, from it can quick focus faster than I can. Um, and I use, I have two different cameras, two different digital cameras. I have one, one crop sensor. My full frame is a Canon 5D. It's an older model, but it suits me just fine. It works just fine. And, um, and I have lots of different lenses, but the amazing thing is, you know, when I first started doing the literary animal, I am, I'm photographing an animal with a book and different scenarios and animals are living beings and they will move and move and move. You know, there's no way you can just keep them still really. So, um, so even in digital, I mean, even in film, excuse me, I used a zoom lens, uh, like a 24 to 70 zoom. That way, if I needed to, I could zoom out or zoom in, depending on where the animal is traveling around. Um, and I also use this, the same basic lens in digital. I feel that that lens is a, just an all around great lens for situations like that, where you're kind of up close, you're not too far away, and you're not sure what's going to happen. You know, like it's not a still life. So with 24 to 70, that's the perfect range of being able to go wide, but not too wide. So it, you know, distorts the image. And 70 millimeters is enough to get up. You're, you're not too far away anyway. So 70 millimeters is fine to get up closer on your subject. Hmm, nice. Um, and you shoot in natural light? Yes. Yes, I mostly, mostly? shoot. Or do you, do you, are you exclusively? I am not exclusively okay. natural light. That is just what I prefer and almost always use. But I have in situations used artificial lighting and um, or flash. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about maybe some of the advantages of film versus digital photography? The actual film, people still call it <laughs> film, but it's there's no film anymore. But um, are there? Uh, do you I miss, do film? miss film? I really do. Uh, I still shoot film occasionally, but it, of course it's much harder to get it processed. And uh, the last time I was in a dark room was probably a couple years ago. So, um, but I still like the way it looks. For me, film looks richer. Um, regardless of what mm -hmm. the depth of field is, to me, the film just, the image looks deeper somehow. Uh, digital to me looks like what it is digitized. So, um, yeah. 
you know, they're, they're constantly still working on digital photography. So there might come a time when digital is more sim fi similar to film. And of course, in editing, there are lots of different effects that you can do uh, with digital images to kind of make them look like film. Um, yeah, but I do, I do miss film. Yes. Yeah, <clears throat> I kind of miss analog, you know, mediums too. Um, but that was inter one thing that you said there uh, grabbed my attention. So when you talk about one thing about digital, possibly that's an advantage is the uh, post-production stuff that you can do to it. Like with Photoshop, are you a big fan of that? Do you use softwares? What kind of softwares? And I, I use Lightroom and Photoshop <laughs> both. And of course I started out with Photoshop, but then when Lightroom came out, I started using Lightroom and I love it, but I like my, I like to use both. I think they complement each other well. So I, when, after I shoot, I um, download my card into Lightroom, which is also a great way to organize. So Lightroom organizes all my shots. I put them into folders and organize them myself. So it's easier for me to find them and then do the basic work on a photo in Lightroom. And then if it needs some special touches, Photoshop is better for that, I think. So then I just, um, you can go right from Lightroom into Photoshop, just throw it into Photoshop. I work on it in Photoshop, then throw it back to Lightroom again. One of the advantages of Lightroom is that you always have your original image no matter how you edit it, you can always go back to your original untouched image. And that's a great advantage. Is that not true with it Photoshop? It can be true with Photoshop, but that's more up to you. Like the user has to remember <laughs> to um, keep it untouched. And yeah. if you don't remember uh -huh. to do that, then yes, it can be, you can alter it and not be able to go back to the beginning again. Yeah, that would be, that could be traumatic. I could see that. But, um, and, and you, but I, I look at, you know, I, I've seen your photos before, you know, before you work with them. Um, and uh, you, it's, it's subtle. You don't really go too, too overboard with, uh, you know, they, they look very similar to the, to the photo as it comes into the processing. I feel like you don't, uh, you know, it's nothing yes, drastic. Yes, very much. I am old school in that way. The um, the great photographers that I learned from and emulate were very much, you know, shoot the way it is, basically. Um, I don't like to crop very much. I like to, you know, crop in camera. I pretty much like to shoot it the way I want it. Um there's always some edits I can do, just the very minor things. So that's why I do that. But um, as far as really altering an image, I rarely ever do that. You know, there are some very artistic people that use Photoshop just for that. And they really um, alter images. It's just like now if you go on the internet, sometimes you can't tell, did, it, did, did that landscape really look like that? Or you know, or did the photographer just edit the crap out of it, you know? And I think, that, mm -hmm. yeah, I think those also have <laughs> yeah. their place. You know, that's another form of artwork. It's, uh, you know, using Photoshop that way is another form of artwork, using a tool to make something. Um, but for me, I'm, I am very old school that way. I don't really like to change things very much because when you think about it, as far as the literary animal goes, uh, you know, people could just take an animal and take a book and put them in the in the shot together. You could easily do Photoshop. Right. But for me, you know, that was one of the things I always stressed about the literary animal is that these are all just the way it was, you know, real animals really reading the book because animal animals do love to read. <laughs> and um, so I, I always stress that, that I didn't just, you know, Photoshop it together or anything like that. And that for me is important. Yeah. Besides the humor 
element, that's kind of the point of the, <laughs> you know, of what you're doing is that, you know, be able to capture that, mm -hmm. that moment. And, um, and they're amazing moments too, um, for sure. I know that you're also involved with, um, you're earning your master's degree in journalism and media studies, or what is, what is your, uh, what's it, what is it called again? Your, your, um, your degree. Mine was journalism and media. Digital Yours journalism is... and design. Mm -hmm. Aha. Yeah. So I'm... Okay. So do you guys get into the ethical part of what you were just talking about? Cause I remember they, we had a lot of discussions about even cropping, you know, it's like, you, have, you can't just like crop the picture to tell the story you want. That's not ethically sound. Yes. That's one of the things that drew me to that master's degree because I also photograph events and things, and um, I have photographed political events um, and just some fun events. And I feel that, you know, I also lean more toward that journalistic type of photography. I don't want to make things look different than they are. Um, I like to think, shoot things the way they are. So that was one of the things that drew me to the program. And, yes, we obviously, yes, we study that often, you know, uh, um, not making things up, you know, no plagiarism, no editing to suit our own agenda, <laughs> no stealing off the internet, etc. You know, <laughs> yeah, those are all those are all a big. So there is an ethical component, even in something that's sort of, in a way, whimsical. There's a bit of depth to it, you know, and it, it, that's that's something I really wanted to see if we could bring out in this interview because to me when I look at one of your photos I see all that it's it comes across to me and I suspect that it probably does you know if, if it happens for me then it probably happens for mm -hmm. everyone else yes. too many people when they see the series of photos will say you know these are whimsical and things like that but mostly they say wow you know that's amazing that you could get the animal to do that, you know? Um, and that was one of the greatest things. I used to do outdoor art shows and have the whole series there for people to buy and, and everything. And um, one of my greatest joys was always people coming up and looking through all the matted prints and just laughing and laughing and laughing because I really, I really like to bring that to people. Yeah, it's it's good. It comes across. It definitely does. Um, I, so that that reminds me of another question. Um, so when you're when you're taking those photos, and given that animals, you know, their sort of their attention span can be kind of short. <laughs> what's some of the what's some of the crazy, <laughs> what's some of the crazy things that might have happened? When, when you know when you were trying to capture this this moment what i'm sure you got some uh some pretty yeah, funny some stories of the things are really amazing that happen i will say this though uh, as far as you know there have been a couple of times when somebody wanted me to photograph their pet and the pet for whatever reason just wanted nothing to do with it and i always stood by the pet in that case you know like i've always felt like if the animal is not is not feeling comfortable I don't like to pursue that. So there were a couple of times where the animal was just like seeming almost like it was scared or something. And I said, you know, we're not going to do this, this, you know, I mean, luckily most of the time the animals are really into it and, you know, and everything. So I do want to say that, like, I don't ever force an animal to sit somewhere and, you know, do what, you know, just force them to do it. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Sure. Sure. So one of the times. When um, al although, I mean, that seems, yeah, that seems like it would be, I think it's important for you to, to, to stress that please, please go yeah. on. But I'm, I'm glad you so said that. So one of the times was um, when that pit bull jumped into my car and that was a woman that lived down the street that had that dog and I did not really know her. And I instantly had the idea, Oh, you know, a pit bull should read the book about heavy metal. 
And I had this idea, you know, to put, <laughs> you remember this, um, <laughs> I had this idea to put the guitar in the photo, an electric guitar in the photo, and, and the heavy metal book, it's the Encyclopedia of Heavy Metal was the title of the book. And, and so we set a time and a day, and I go over there to do it, and the dog was just crazy. I did not know that the dog was still kind of a puppy, because it was a big dog, and Really, the dog just wanted to play, and I did not have an electric guitar, so I had gone to I had <laughs> gone to the local music store and asked them if I could rent an electric guitar, and they said, "No, we don't rent them, but you can buy it and return it." You know, as long as I told the guy what I wanted to do, I said, I "Have this idea for this photo with this dog, and I need a guitar in the picture," you know, and um. He said, well, you can buy it and, you know, just return it as long as it's not damaged. I said, okay. So I buy the guitar and I go to take the picture of the dog and the dog is just insane running around playing and everything like that. And so the whole time I'm like grabbing the guitar, trying to protect the guitar and everything like that. I did get that shot. So whenever I look at that photo, I remember the hecticness of that and me protecting that electric guitar and everything went fine. I returned the guitar <laughs> but um that was just one of the experiences you know i also bought a um studded dog collar for that dog to have on in the picture mm -hmm. yeah it's a cool photo do you if you if you don't mind we might put that in the timeline yeah. so people can yeah. look at it yes we should definitely yeah whatever should definitely you're comfortable with in the timeline yeah mm -hmm. How many literary animal um, well, photos I mean, do you I, think you have? Yeah, I honestly have lost count, but there's over 100 for sure. Um, and I would say wow. that would be 100 good ones. I mean, I have photographed many animals with many books, and not all of them are what I would call, you know, good photos, or they don't really, they don't really make it into the collection that way, but. I would say definitely over 100 of ones that I would consider to be really good, you know, that I, that I've showed at art shows. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. Yeah. And That's some, a lot. Like I said, some of the ones I'm most proud of are the ones that are unusual animals. Like I, I thought I found a horse to read sea biscuit and that horse, I kept <laughs> setting the book up on a, it was like, I was putting the book up on the fence and the horse was being playful and it would come over and just knock it over, take it nose and knock it over. Just I'd set it back up and knock it over again, just playing a game, you know. But I did finally get that photo also. <laughs> and uh, yeah, mostly um, the things that the animals would do would, would mostly make the photos better, though. Like that one I told you about with the dog and the call of the wild. And um you know, there have been lots of experiences like that. Finding the pig was really a challenge also. <laughs> I would I would just keep asking people, do you know where this pig? And somebody told me, oh, there's a pig. <laughs> yeah, really. I saw this guy that golfed in Largo, he said, well, there's a pig at somebody's backyard um, off of the eighth hole at the Largo golf course. So I <laughs> drive down there one day and I, you know, I, I go to the golf course I talk to the people that work at the golf course. They show me where the eighth hole is. I see it. So then I have to take my car and drive around like all, you know, way far away to go to the back streets of where that would be behind the golf course. I find the street. It's a dead end street. Of course I find the street. I go down to the end. I can see the golf course. I see the house. I see a big fenced in backyard. This must be where the pig is. So I go up to the door and I say, do you have a pig? <laughs> <laughs> yes, they had a pig. And that pig's name was Rosebud. And yeah. Why, yes, we that do. That woman, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I must have sounded crazy, right? Hi, I take pictures of animals reading books and I really want a photo of a pig reading the South Beach <laughs> diet. Can I photograph your pig? And unbelievably, she says yes. And, um, and it was the greatest thing because I worked with that pig for, you know, probably at least an hour 
the pig came when it was called and it loved Cheerios. So I ran to the store and bought a box of Cheerios. And so that's how I enticed it to come over toward the book. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. That's how people entice me. (laughs) Cheerios. Definitely. (laughs) Man, that sounds pretty awesome. So I feel that you get these ideas and then you'll go to some pretty pretty great lengths to make that idea happen. That's true. I will. um, There is something about that. You know, once I make up my mind and I can see this, I will do almost anything to accomplish it. I have spent money. I have gone (laughs) out of my comfort zone. I have driven, you know, way too far. You know, I have done all different kinds of things. But that is the great thing about art. I think that any artist who feels that understands that, you know, when you have this inspiration and then to be able to make it come alive the vision that you have be able to see it it's it's a, it's such a fulfilling experience and um that is that is one of the things that really that's why i call the literary animal my passion project because i am so passionate about this and I, it's like i said it's one of my favorite things to do I love having these ideas, you know, and like, honestly, I, when I first started doing it, I thought, well, you know, I could do 12 of these and make a calendar. I thought, you know, I probably won't be able to think more than 12 of them. And then they right. just kept coming and kept coming, and kept coming. I mean, I, and still to this day, you know, I still think of some and, and think, oh, I got to find a dog that looks like that. Or I have to, you know, or I'll meet somebody and I'll be, you know, seeing their dog and I'll think, Oh, what would that, what would that dog read or, you know, cat or whatever. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's great. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I feel like it's almost a healing thing when I I loved, you know, I love a picture that will make me laugh. There's an art to that, you know, and it's in itself, you know, if you look at the meme thing, I feel like the memes are kind of, they're a little bit more mean spirited. Uh, sometimes that can be funny, but uh, I really like what you do because um, it's just a, you know, good, clean, fun, you know, and um, although the picture of Avis <laughs> with the doobie, that was pretty cool. <laughs> also a good photo. It's not about the money for you, apparently, (laughs) Um, because you're going to a lot of trouble. How long? I mean, what do you there? There might not be a ballpark, but what do you think is the average amount of of time that you would spend getting getting a literary animal? Well, um, the actual shoot itself would probably be about an hour. And that's only because and that's an average, because most of the time I wouldn't want to work with an animal longer than that because the animal gets tired you know um yeah they kind of get like oh come on what are we doing you know so i don't i don't ever want to stress an (laughs) animal out so i always feel like but of course the preparation time before that you know coming up with the idea thinking about it figuring out how to make it actually happen the place the time etc um that takes a lot of time and then actually working with the animal probably about an hour and then after that, you know, just editing it and printing it and things is, you know, so it's really, um, it's really a labor of love. That's for sure. But I do feel like, you know, I've always done this and I feel like I will always do this. It's just a part of my life. It doesn't matter if I'm selling things or being paid. Um, it's just what I do. And I'm so grateful for it. And I also feel like it really has incorporated everything together, you know, because I do believe in having a sense of humor. I love to laugh. Um, I love bringing laughter to other people. I love photography. I love books. So the literary animal really has, it's me all in one thing, you know, the laughter, the joy, 
the whimsical, the, the reading aspect, the literary aspect, the animals, you know, it's, a, it's really a gift. Yeah. The photography. Mm -hmm. Also that. Yeah. Yeah. And you do have, I mean, you, because you have, uh, there are postcards. Um, I think you've printed some shirts before. Of course, you know, people can go to your website. You have a website. Uh, it's liter is it yes, literary it is. Yeah. com. Is that what it is? Hey, I got it. Literaryanimal.com, which, and are all the, most of the photos are on there, right? At least the hundred that you talked about, or well, you have a yes, lot of stuff um, on there. No, not all the photos are on the website, but a good, a good example of them, I would say. I have a page for dogs, a page for cats, and then a page for other various animals. So I think it just gives a good um, idea of the scope of them. And, but not all the ones I've done are on there, but I, I'll keep working on that to get more of them on there. But there's a good selection on there so people can get the idea. It's a good website. I've been to it. it it's got, you know, it's good functionality. So, you you know, it's not confusing. And when you click a link, you it takes you to the photo so you can look at it. It's a good, good site that you put together. How long have you had I've your had the website? website for... 14 years, I believe. Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah, so a people, long time. People can contact me through That's the almost... website, and I sell the prints, the matted prints, or greeting cards. So um, things can be ordered also by contacting me through the website. I wonder if you would ever consider doing like a commission, like if someone said, hey, we really want, we love our pet, and we want to do... Um, you know, we want to do a literary animal. We want to have it reading a book. Have you ever oh, done yeah. one of People those or considered it? Many times they want their pet to be reading a certain book, you know, maybe their favorite book. Because for me, the literary animal started <laughs> out with, you know, the mice and men, but of mice and men, which it correlates with a cat. So the ones that I do, usually the, the type of animal it is has something to do with the book they're reading. And, um, but I have done specialized one for pe specialized ones for people where they want their favorite book, or maybe it's a book that has something to do with the name of the animal, uh, that, you know, other people might not get it, but, you know, it's, it's their pet's name, you know? So, um, yeah, I've done, I, I definitely do those also. So that's pretty cool. And, you know, I think, we, you know, we have at least 10 subscribers on my channel. <laughs> so, you know, if you're listening to this, you can get, you know, you can, you can have, you can have a postcard, you could have a shirt, you can have all this funny stuff with animals. It's very unique. I guarantee you, this is my guarantee to you. You haven't seen anything like this before. It's really cool. Although I do see occasionally people kind of ripping you off <laughs> a little bit since you're getting, I believe that since you're sort of starting to permeate through the, you know, through the internet, I, I see people kind of stealing your ideas, but I definitely, before very recently, I never saw anything, anything right. like it at all. Yes. Very, mm -hmm. very different. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's uh, um, so. Uh, is there? Uh, have we neglected to cover anything? I wanted to try to keep it, you know, just uh, conversational. But um, this is the opportunity. So for me to to find out, is there something that I forgot to ask you? No, I can't you? think of anything. It's just been great. Well, um, it's good. You know, so all the pleasures all on this side, believe me, <laughs> like office space, you know, the bobs um, <laughs> pleasures all on this side of the table, <laughs> Peter. <laughs> but I would like to ask one last uh, favor of you, if you like, what kind of what kind of advice can you give? Because it's difficult. And I mean, we all have to go out and <clears throat> somehow make our way in the world. It's difficult and trying sometimes to balance that if you have any art sort of artistic inclination it's not always acceptable <laughs> and it's tough uh can you give any maybe a little bit of encouragement or helpful advice for 
maybe someone who who is uh, creative and open benefit from yes, your I experience. Yes, I definitely say follow your heart, follow your instincts. Don't do what everybody else is doing if it doesn't feel right to you. You know, it's okay to emulate people if you see something you like, etc. But you don't have to do what everybody else is doing. Uh, listen to what is inside of you. And if you're really interested in something, keep going with that. Just keep going with it. You will find a way. Um, just really listen to that inner artist. And even if you think it might be crazy or something like that, go anyway. You know, just keep going. Show your work to other people. <laughs> Get their input. Listen, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to take everything that they say as right or wrong, but get their input, you know, feel it out, you know, and keep going in your own direction for sure. Keep your sense of humor, stay playful. That's great advice. I think that's, uh, I think that's a beautiful positive note that we hit there. Yeah, I think so that's too. nice. Well, Elizabeth Faubert, um, photographer extraordinaire. That's a nice little, <laughs> yeah, I, like that? I just made a poem there. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, you can check her out literary com. and thank you so much for your, um, for your time and all your knowledge and everything. It, um, I, it answered a lot of questions for me. I appreciate that. And I'm sure that people will enjoy listening to this. So thank you, thank so, you much. so much. All right. Well, um, tune in next week when we've got Monster <laughs> Truck Rally. No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's great. Grave digger. Um, so uh, anyway, seriously, I appreciate it. And uh, I guess, I don't know, I guess that's it. Do you have anything more that you'd that's like it. to add?